Well, in our house, we are devotees of the show Bluey. Now, if you're not familiar with Bluey, I have a picture of Bluey. I'm truly sorry if you have not yet made Bluey a part of your life. You should go home and forsake all basketball and watch it immediately this afternoon on Disney+. Plus. It's a simple show about mom, dad, Bingo, and her sister, Bluey. All four of them are blue healers, and they live in Australia. Bluey and Bingo love to play wildly imaginative games, and they love to play the boring kids' games we all loved and grew up with. You know, things like keeping a balloon up in the air so that it won't touch the ground or else the house will fall down and the universe will end. They call it keepy uppy on that show. But one of my favorite things about the show is that it captures perfectly the plight of parents. See here, dad. In the second episode of the whole series, Bluey and Bingo, they go to their dad and they say, come on, dad, 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 daddy, dad. And Bluey's dad says what I feel in my bones many days. Isn't there some game we can play where I just lay really still on a really comfy bed or something? Right now? Now? Really? It reminds me of yesterday we were at my parents' house and my girls were playing with their cousins when one of them ran in and said, come on, Dad, you, you are the tickle monster. Now we're going to go hide. And I said, okay. And they said, and you're going to come find us. And I said, yeah. (laughs) Soon. I mean, I don't like to feel rushed. You don't like to feel rushed either. I don't like to be put on the spot. I was in the middle of a conversation with my sister. I had things going on. There's a modern parable modern parable, almost an urban legend, that it was a Sunday morning when the man came into the church building. The deacons in charge of preparing communion arrived early, and when they did, there was a man on the front steps who had been laying asleep in what appeared to be heavily soiled flannel. It wasn't uncommon for there to be people sleeping on the steps of the church, and so when the leaders arrived, they just passed right by without a second thought. Later, as the fathers with their floral-dressed daughters started to show up, the man began to stir, and folks could see that his hands and his face were somewhat dirty with a long, unkempt beard. His hair was filled with knots and mats that came down over his eyes. The young parents hurried past while their kiddos asked questions, and the greeters at the front door smiled at them and handed them a bulletin and welcomed them in. About that time, the man began to gather his belongings, and suddenly he stood and he turned toward the doors of the church and entered in. The deacon at the door smiled, but also with one hand held on to his cell phone. The man gently walked past him and sat down on the back row of the sanctuary. And as he sat down, some of the folks who sat usually around that space began to space out a little bit, given an invisible force field. No one approached him or said hi. Service began, music fired up, prayers were said, scriptures were read, and then it was time for the sermon. But, well, where's the preacher? I told you that this was a modern parable, a kind of story you've heard before, an urban legend. You know where he was, right? You've gotten this email forward. You've read it on Facebook or you've watched the video on YouTube. How do you hear a story that you think you've heard before again, as though you're hearing it for the first time? You know where the preacher was. The man on the back row stood up in a flourish of special effects and lights, pulled off the glued-on beard, cast away the wig of mats, pushed off the flannel, and stood up and proclaimed, I was a stranger, 
and you did not welcome me. And there he is, the preacher, found. Of course, he conspicuously looks like the judge and the jury, too, in that moment. And anyone who's ever been through a seminary preaching and homiletics class knows that the first rule of preaching and taught in seminaries everywhere is people will get your point better and feel better about your care as a pastor if you look at them directly and point at them and tell them everything they're doing wrong. That's a joke. I've always been bothered by that story. Every time the email forward lands in my inbox, and it does, three to four times a year. It comes across my Facebook feed, and every single time I see it, there's a sense of manipulation in it. Of manufactured and unnecessary guilt to it. There's also a deep lack of compassion in it an overabundance of judgment. I mean, over the past few weeks of Lent, as we've preached these parables, we've used one word to describe parables. Invitation. The parables are an invitation to deeper meaning. This story that you know already, it's not an invitation to deeper meaning, it's a conviction a conviction of guilt, failed expectations. It's clear in that story who we want to be and who we don't want to be. The bottom line of the story for all those folks who failed or who didn't talk to the man or who didn't welcome him or distance themselves from him. You fail, do better. That's no invitation. It doesn't ask us to think. It doesn't invite us to be different. I don't like to be put on the spot. And I need you to know that if we're not careful, this is how our story that Gary read for us this morning could make us feel. At first glance, our parable for today can feel like a conviction. But I wonder if there is an invitation here that's stronger than that conviction. A question we could ask that will invite us to a new way of faithfulness that is and will constantly be renewing to us. There's a man about whom we get to know everything, it seems, but his name. We know he feasts sumptuously each night in his home, and the language that's used to describe that is the same that's used to describe wedding banquets. He sets up a feast every night. And attending this feast, he wears the finest and most expensive purple cloaks, sets the tables with fine linens, and wears fine linens right outside his door. Some translations say that it's outside of his gate, but the Greek seems to suggest it's closer than distant away. Right outside the door of this nameless rich dude is a man who gets a name. Lazarus. Whereas the rich man sets a sumptuous feast every night, Lazarus' stomach groans as he smells the finely cooked meats. As he watches through the windows as the table is set, he begs for scraps from the table. And I'm sure there are many. Not only that, we know how he is dressed too. Not in purple cloth and linen, but with open sores. So bad that scavenger dogs from the city come and lick them. Waiting for the day when their meal will be more substantial. Now before we get to this next part of the story, I want to remind you of something. A caveat that Reverend Shanna and I have offered in several of the other parables that we have preached. Parables are not histories. Parables are not accountings for what is real and factual and true about the world. Parables are stories. And stories can go anywhere. Stories invite us to questions about our life that we're living here and now. Jesus told them to living people so that they might think about how they are living. 
This is a good thing to be mindful of because I am quite literally about to take this sermon to hell. And if we're not careful, we might confuse this point. And somehow we might end up believing this is a story more about the shape of an afterlife than it is about the shape of the one that we're living right now. Again, it's not necessarily about conviction. More so, it's about invitation. Lazarus dies first. He's taken away by angels. The rich man dies next. His life affords him the ability to be buried. And suddenly we're in act two. The roles of the two men are reversed. Lazarus, held in the bosom of Abraham, receives all of the care and closeness and comfort that he didn't in this life. And the rich man finds himself in a place of torment and he cries out, help me. I need you to know that I still don't like the rich man in act two. Because, well, the one that he overlooked his whole life, Lazarus, is not even the one that he calls to. The man who spent his whole life with power brokers and stakeholders in this world cries out to the one who he holds relation, not to the one with whom he holds relationship, but to the one he recognizes as the most powerful one in the room. Help me, Abraham. Send Lazarus. Now we learn two things real quick in Act 2. The first is that the man's not ready to let go of his privilege. He wants to talk straight to the manager. And two, the rich man knows Lazarus' name. He doesn't say it in Act 1, but in Act 2, it's clear. They had some connection, some relationship. They knew each other. Abraham scoffs. He uses an interesting word in the Greek, technon, which means child. I say it's interesting because last week Reverend Shanna preached about a different child, the prodigal child. The same word that's used in that parable, that the father of the prodigal son uses to describe his wayward child, who has wasted so much and who has now returned home into his loving arms, is the word Abraham uses for the rich man who has now come to this moment of pain. Just like the prodigal son, this man's gone out on his own beyond the gifts and graces of what we conceive to be right. But unlike the prodigal son, Abraham does not have open arms. Child, you remember all that you had in life? Remember that Lazarus was outside your gate and you knew who he was and he was suffering? Just like you kept that distance between you and him in life, we keep that distance here. And now that distance is a chasm. That's what the story says. That makes this story feel so definite. What question is this story inviting us to? Maybe if we go to the questions the other parables have asked us, it might be helpful. You know, when Shanna preached about the prodigal son, the question last week was, who am I supposed to be in this? Who am I supposed to be? Am I more like the younger son or the older son or the father? Who do I want to be in this? Was that our question? Who do I want to be in this story? I'm not sure I want to be like Lazarus in this life. And if the story is about how we live here and now, Lazarus doesn't seem to get a break. I'm not sure I want to be like the rich man either. Because the distance I keep from the one who is broken outside my door, and it puts me in a position of cruelty. I don't want to be that. I mean, it seems like the answer is obvious. I want to be more like Lazarus because then I get comfort. But again, parables are invitations to think about how we're living here and now. So is that the question that we should be asking from this story? Maybe we can reach back further. We preached the parable of the Good Samaritan a while ago. The question in that story is, who is my neighbor? The answer there was clear, right? Jesus says, which one was a neighbor to the man on the road? And the legal expert says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. But again, I'm not sure that that question holds up with this story because 
Well, the rich man doesn't show mercy. Who is my neighbor? I'm not sure that's the best question for us to ask here. Are we supposed to ask the question we asked in the parable of the lost coin and the lost sheep? What am I looking for? Well, again, the rich man doesn't seem to be looking at all. And Lazarus is looking at food. Well, did anybody here major on journalism? Who, what, where, when, why, and how? We've used up a few of them. Mostly what's left is where and when. And I already told you when we started today that if you're focusing on where, you're probably not going to get as much from this story as it might be intended to give you. No, no. I think this story is about the when. When will we act? When will it be enough for us to care? When will you step forward and do what's right? When will you step forward and care for those who are at your doorstep? The question of this story that you are invited to take from it When will I live as the beloved of God I know myself to be? And when will I see the beloved in others? You know, here at Community, we have beloved friends experiencing homelessness who regularly cycle through the life of this place. We know some of their names, or we know what they tell us their names are. And in some cases, we know parts of their stories because we've sat with them in the food pantry or in the front hallway and we've listened to them. We've done a great deal to help many number of folks to have something to eat, to provide a hotel room for an evening or two, to get a bus ticket to help someone to the next stop on their journey, or to pay a utility bill in portion or in full. My guess is that when you drove here this morning, if you came from 71 Highway, although it was cold this morning, I know, you might have been met by the people who sit at the corner of Cleaver and 71. Or if you come through the plaza, you've seen the street buskers who play on the corners there and the men who sit in the medians or who used to sit in the medians on Main Street. And every week when you come here, you see what you see and you help how you can. As a congregation... We've walked alongside some of these people as they've made the arduous journey to find housing, to secure stable work, to confront issues of personal health. We've walked with people as they've confronted mental health or domestic violence. We've helped some face down issues with substance abuse. And we've wept tears of deep grief when no matter how much help We've offered cycles of poverty and all of their complications have devoured constructive progress and threatened hope. My guess is that no matter where you live, if you look hard enough, you will see people with cardboard sign scrawls and you may see people sleeping in stairwells or pickle buckets filled with change. And if you can't see that, then it's likely that you've chosen not to. And I would remind you of the words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. The poor you will always have with you. I mean, maybe that's why this story feels so uncomfortable to us today. Just as the story of the pastor who impersonates one experiencing homelessness. Not because it tells us that we're not doing good enough, but because it constantly asks us when. When will we help? When will I see the belovedness in another? When will I do this? There's a third part of the story that we haven't covered yet. After Abraham says no to the nameless rich man, the rich man says, then at least raise Lazarus from the dead. More privilege. He doesn't know to talk to the one with whom he has a relationship. At least raise Lazarus from the dead and send him to my five brothers so that they can live differently. And Abraham says, do you think that they're going to listen to a zombie any more than they'll listen that that they already have? There's an urgency here that invites us to see the work we're already doing as good and invites us to continue to ask the question of when. It says even though we've worked, there's still more to do. 
What will it take for us to help? What will it take for you to help? In the ancient words of Rabbi Hillel, often misquoted to Ronald Reagan, if not me, who? If not now, when? When invites us to confront not just homelessness, but any place where God flips the script for justice. Just like we know Lazarus' name and not the rich man's, the script is flipped. When invites us to every place where the power dynamic is different, where we can lose privilege, where we can disable entitlement, where we can help the last become first. When? When? Now. Because if we don't, we may never. The point of the story of the rich man and Lazarus isn't necessarily a final verdict. It's that when we constantly push it off, we never know when we won't answer the question of when. I've been thinking all week about Lindsay. If you went with us on our intergenerational mission trip to Nashville last summer, you met Lindsay. This is a picture of Lindsay on the day that we met her in a poverty immersion in downtown Nashville. She took us to the smallest park in Nashville and she pointed out to us that it was maybe no bigger than the room you're in right now. But as we were standing there, she invited us to look around the park and to spot the security cameras. And all we counted 16 focused on the small park. A high-rise apartment of 41 stories had been built right next to the park. And the residents did not like to look on it because those experiencing homelessness slept in the park at night so that they could get easy and early access to the Nashville Public Library across the street. Lindsay encouraged us to notice, to open our eyes to see that all of the benches in the park had been pulled and that there was nowhere to rest. She encouraged us to open our eyes to the way that police lingered at the corners of the park. Friends, it was no bigger than this room. She looked at us with this t-shirt on, if you've noticed it yet. It says, let this radicalize you. When we pay attention, we know that the answer to win is always right now. We know that it pushes through our inactions and it invites us to the spiritual practice of allowing the world to affect us here and now. It reminds me of a quote from the United Methodists. I know that some of us weren't raised Methodists, but we can borrow wisdom from John Wesley. Do all the good you can in all the ways you can, to all the souls you can, in every place you can, at all the times you can, with all the zeal you can, as long as ever you can. Let us be a people of the now. Let this moment radicalize you. Let this story help you ask the question, when? Let it catch you in the grace of God when you can't. And let it move you when it will. Thanks be to God. Amen.